Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocal script top, so you listen to my podcast, Vox and Hops, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. I hope that you guys are holding up well. I hope that you are staying safe. I hope that uh, you had a great weekend. I have had a great weekend. I took it easy. I relaxed a bit. It's always nice to kick back, to take a little bit of a break from uh, the madness that uh, comes with running a podcast. I uh, decided to take it a little easy and just relax a little bit. So that felt really good. This is a, a very cool, special episode. I have teamed up with uh, Cheney Crab and Naveen Copperweiss, and we have done a split episode. So this is the first part of a two-part episode. The first part of this interview is on Vox and Hops, and then the second part of it is on the Copper Crab podcast, and the link for that is available in the description of this podcast. I strongly suggest that you uh, head on over there so you can see how all this ends. Not only is it a special episode in that regard, it is also a spotlight on Everlasting Spew Records episode. This week I'm super stoked to bring you a track from Sea Rocks. This is a band that I have been following for quite some time. There are some people involved in it from Montreal that I know quite well, so huge shout-out to all the people that I know that are a part of this project. This is a track called Being from their album The Phobos Diamos Suite, which uh, has probably some of the sickest artwork that I've ever seen. This uh, dropped uh, back in October 2018, this is an incredible track from an incredible band. Here's Being from Sea Rocks.
crazy. I, I, I've heard this before. Huge fan of this band. Super stoked on the brutality. Everlasting Spew Records does not fuck around. They know where the brutality is at and the technicality is at. You should absolutely go check out and support Sea Rocks. If this is the first time you hear of them, if it is not the first time you hear of them, you should still go support them. Artists are struggling right now, and the best thing you can do is support the things that you love. On today's episode, as I mentioned, I am with Naveen Copper Weiss and Chaney Crab of the band Entios and the Copper Crab Podcast. Here it is, Vox and Hops, episode number 131. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I am with Cheney Crab and Naveen Copper Weiss from Entios and the Copper Crab Podcast. I am super stoked to, to be with you both. I have been following your podcast since the beginning because uh, there are not many metal-themed podcasts out there, especially in our level of metal. There's the Jamie Jasta, which is, you know, slightly higher up there with the hate breeds versus uh, where Cryptopsy and NTO sit. There was Monty Bernard that had one going for a little bit. Big shout out to Monty. When I started Vox and Hops, I watched his progress going. So I'm stoked to hang out with you guys. Uh, how are you? How are you handling social isolation? We're uh, loving it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We well, Naveen has been has taken our tour van and has built it or has started building it into a camper van. Yeah, like a camper van, a van life type thing. If you look up the hashtag van life on Instagram, that's kind of what he's going for. And uh, we've been writing music, and it's honestly the whole quarantine thing to me is living the dream life. Yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> I mean, until like the money runs out, we're having a great time. You're definitely not the first two people to say that to me. But I mean, as of now, it's fuck, man. I, I don't mind it at all. Channing and I like to do stuff at home. Like we've kind of created our home to be a place that we really like to be at. Like as, as far as we can record music, we have a backyard, we have a little gym, we have a lot of stuff like that. So the need to leave is very minimal. Yeah, and now we don't have to feel guilty if we don't want to leave <laughs> yeah. and go to a party or, you know, anytime that we turn down the offer to go somewhere, I always have FOMO, fear of missing out. And now I have none of that. So that for me is yeah. good. That anxiety has gone away and we're just kind of chilling and enjoying it. It's sort of like a two edged sword being an artist because we have to get out there to perform to people most of the time. But most of the time we're all introverts. Yeah, I right. actually like being just by ourselves. I know, I know. <laughs> I know, and it's such a stark contrast on tour. I always get super worn out being on tour. And for the first week or so, it's totally fine with me to go and talk to people and it, it's chill. But eventually I get super worn out by talking to people. And a lot of the time when you're touring with your band, the the questions that people come up and ask you on a nightly basis are generally the same to no fault of their own but you know it's just kind of the same wheelhouse of questions same question over and over again yeah because the nature of what you're doing exactly so uh, it gets tiring and we were supposed to be on tour right this moment so i'm kind of i'm sad that we're not on tour but i'm i'm it's nice to take a breather and not have to be on tour for a while I was disappointed uh, as all tours were canceled uh, about that tour specifically with Archspire, you guys, and Surreption, and I'm forgetting one band. Wormhole. Wormhole, yes, yes. Uh, I was so excited to see my brothers in Surreption come through Montreal to finally meet you guys, but it's okay. I, 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 I've heard there might be a rescheduling happening, so. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've heard about that too. We don't have any uh, definitive answers right now, as no one really does, but we were stoked about going out with Surreption again. And we sort of, we know the Arch Spire guys, we've never toured together. So we're excited to get to have that experience. But the last time we went out with Surreption, they had to leave. Uh, it was Summer Slaughter of 2019, I think. Uh, yeah. I don't but, know. I'm bad with dates. Yeah. But they <laughs> had to leave halfway through the tour and didn't get to finish it. So I was excited to see them do an entire tour and get to see them every night. I want this whole fucking visa shit 
to just go away. It's so annoying. It's so annoying, and it's it's. I spoke. I, I had just did an interview with Frederick the other day, and uh, we spoke at length about all this and how it's just out of their control, and they don't even have a real answer as to why it happens. It's it's, it's so frustrating, and I can only imagine how frustrating it could be for for the artists involved, let alone the fans that are showing up to the shows and can't watch the artists that they want to see. Right. Absolutely, and even for you guys uh, living in Canada, it costs a lot of money to tour here. Correct. It depends. Yes, you got you got your P twos or your P ones. It depends what route you take. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is quite pricey, but there's ways to dance around it to make it a little bit less pricey. But one way or another, you're going to spend some money if you want to tour anywhere right now. Yeah, yeah I don't think that uh, a lot of people outside of the business realize how lucky Americans who tour are because it takes virtually no effort for us to tour around the entire world, whereas it takes everyone a lot of effort to get into America. That's one of the reasons that our circuit is so hard to break into for outside bands, because it costs a ton of money to bring your band to America, specifically. Just like all these bands, and super huge shout out to your first... uh... Zoom interviewee uh, Dan DeFonce for rescheduling Devastation on the Nation. I know. Yep. Uh, a whole year later, but while it all still falls into the visas applications that were made for this year's. So, so very smart, very, very good move on his part and on the management of Bork Nagar and Rodden Christ and all the other bands. Yeah, that was amazing. I think he said he had like a, a couple day window that he was just falling short of. So that's incredible that he was able to pull that off. I'm talking more than usual, uh, so I'm getting thirsty. Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with your favorite metal friends and uh, talking about their lives, music, and, of course, craft beer. Oh, shit. Oh. What do you guys yeah. have uh, on your side there? Show show me what you you got for uh, your Vox and Hops. Wait. Oh, no, can I hang, yeah. We got, uh, I've got Heretic, a fruitful world. And I've got a uh, SoCal Fermentation Project Red Number no. Three with Sour cha- Cherry. It's a wild ale aged in oak barrels with sour cherries. I wonder if that's a sour beer. No, I don't know yet. I I'm would think it's going to be slightly tart. It's going to be tart and wild. Yeah. There we go. It's going to taste. It's going to taste farmy. Well, <laughs> Cheney is tart and wild. I don't know if it's farmy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little farmy. I mean, I'm from <laughs> Iowa, right? That's Horn. On my side, I'm drinking Echo Session Ales Hazy Session IPA. A uh, huge shout out to JF Legency, their head brewer and the guy behind Echo Session Ales, for coming and braving quarantine to come and bring me some of these brews so that I can share them with my guests, even though we're not together. Cheers. Maybe you need to open it. I already cracked mine. I missed the opportunity. I got mine cracked. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, this is a nice color. I got this one because I'm. Um, SoCal is in Santa Cruz where we live. It's like, it's a, would it be called a township? It's just a town. It's a town in the county that we live in. So it's where I'm from, from. We lived there and now we live a mile away from SoCal. So yeah, this is very sour. It's good though. All right. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. Thank you guys for coming being a part of Vox and Hops. Yeah, thanks for having us. You like those hazies? I'm all about the hazies. Uh, a typical beer night for me will be to start with a nice sour, move into some hazies, and then end up with a big dark stout. That's my, my go-to go to night. Plan. I know. Menu. This man's got an agenda. Yes. I like it. <laughs> stout is a good one to end the night with, though. You know, the stout, it it's so heavy that you just have to go to sleep after you drink one. The Echo Session Ales Hazy Session IPA is uh, juicy. Uh, it's uh, slightly bitter, but not really at all. Uh, it. Uh, I normally don't like session beers, but Echo Session Ales makes really the best ones here in Quebec. So, what well, makes it a session? I don't, I don't uh, it's a low is. low alcohol. This is a three point oh, nine okay. ABV. So not a Dick Ripper. It's oh, that the is right. Ripper. <laughs> you, you, do you have to know about the Dick Ripper, right, Matt? I do not. Oh, oh okay. do you know who Bill Oberender is? Merch guy. He works for Hate Breed now. He used to work for the Contortionist all the time. I'm sure we've crossed him. Yeah, he. Yeah calls anything that's over a 7% a certified dick ripper. <laughs> so right now I am certified. drinking a certified dick ripper. Oh, is that one? Yes. Coming in at a nice 7, a cool 7. Dang. This is a 5.2. It's good. It's um, it's actually got a little bit of a sour note 
to it, this beer here. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fruity, which is good. I usually like hazies as well. Me too. Hazies or fruities, fruity, fruities or uh, Belgians. I used to really like Belgians and then the IPA thing became a huge craze and I was pretty anti IPA. I thought it was kind of gross. And then I started having the more like hazy East Coast ones, I guess it's called. And that won me over. I guess you could say. And yeah. now I kind of like that more than the Belgian, honestly. Well, yeah, the thing is, we were both huge fans of Delirium, and but we've been drinking IPAs for a while. About two weeks ago, we decided to pick up a Delirium and share one, and it just wasn't that good anymore. Ooh. Yeah. It, feel, <laughs> it, la- it lacks that, so. flavor. Yeah, it lacks the flavor of an IPA. It's the oldest beer company. Maybe probably. maybe it was just a bad bottle. You never know. It could, yeah, it could have been. That. I don't know. True just, that. You get used to a certain taste, I guess. Well, cheers for drinking some local brews right now. Very important uh, as uh, supporting all of your favorite artists yeah, during their time of need right now. Local craft breweries, as well as a bunch of other businesses are suffering. So cheers uh, for helping support the local industries. That's yeah, right. buddy. Oh, yeah. Do you remember your first beer? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. It was um, Mickey's. Really? Remember that shit? Uh, it's like, I don't know if you guys have, in Canada, I don't know if you guys have that, but it's it's the bottle is shaped like a little, like a little keg kind of, and it's got a wide mouth top. They might not even make it anymore. I don't know, but it's all I can think of is Heineken. It's just some trashy beer. I had my mom had a boyfriend who was drinking the beer and he like gave me and my brother one. So I can't say that I was into it. I didn't like it. And then actually I remember after that, the, the another beer that I had was like a Tecate, uh, but I, I don't know. I wasn't that into it. Yeah, my first one, I think, was a Bud Light. And I hated the taste of beer for so long. Until these bougie beers came along, the craft brewery ca- craze, I truly hated beer. Uh, my my parents really like Coors Light. It, it None of it tastes good. It all does taste like piss water. So I was way more into just liquor. But now I like beer a lot. Do you remember that first craft beer that really turned you on to, to beer? Delirium. For me. Probably the same here. I don't know. That or uh, what was the other Belgian one that was... It's not even craft beer at this point, but it's uh, Ho Garden. Yeah, and that's funny with the giant glass. Yeah, <laughs> I had that because uh, Evan liked it. Ah, uh, yeah. And then that was that was probably the first like craft beer I liked, I guess. But it's not really craft beer at this point because no one with a mustache makes it. That's funny. I you, you reminded me that I used to go and drink Ho Gardens, and I would order it because it came in this huge glass, which I actually have one here because I stole it. And uh, <laughs> it, it, in reality, it's just a standard pint, but the glass is just so thick. <laughs> okay. And whenever people, uh, I tell my first craft beer story, I always forget about Ho Garden. I always fast forward to a to a to a later beer. So that's funny. Yeah. What's what was the first craft beer that you drank? Oh, coming from Montreal. Uh, there's, you know, all the uni brews, uh, the Boreals. When I started playing, uh, when I, before I was in Cryptopsy, I was in Three Mile Scream. We would play at this club called the Sapphire and the only beers that they had that they would accept for the beer coupons, which they gave us that night were Boreal beers. So I started drinking, uh, their blonde ale through that. And it's, it's still a very big brewery, but it's, it's much more craft than Molson or Labatt. Oh, okay. Labatt, Bl- Labatt blue. That's right. I don't drink that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Reform. T- take me back uh, to your youth uh, when you're growing up in your houses. Uh, what music was playing when you were not in control of the music? What music did your parents or guardians listen to? My parents, um, my dad is really into country and classic rock. Uh, my dad's favorite band is Boston. So because of him, yeah, he loves Boston. So I... I'm really, really into country music, specifically like 90s, Garth Brooks, the Randy Travis's, Brooks and Dunn's, uh, all of that type of stuff. Uh, my mom listened to a lot of Madonna, Fleetwood Mac, the 80s, like Stevie Nicks stuff. Uh, and But she at the same time is the person who had the Black album, Metallica, and that's how I heard of that. Uh, well, my dad's a drummer, so... He kind of showed me like Yes and uh, some jazz like Elvin Jones and stuff like that. But uh, I guess it was that. And then all the other stuff that my parents liked, I just didn't like it all, hated it. 
So I remember I listened to metal. I remember you telling me that your dad was really into that uh Sting song, Desert Sting, Desert yeah. Rain. They listen to like Sting and Shaw Day. Well, Shaw like, Day fucking rules. So I mean uh, I, I still like Sting. My dad calls him Stink though. <laughs> Stink. Okay, that's it's true. It's true. <laughs> um I mean I don't dislike it. It's just when you're a kid, I don't know. I, I didn't like the music that my parents liked very much. I think it's important to, as as a youth and to for anyone to develop their own music yeah. uh, personality yeah. is you have to hate your parents' music to a certain point to find your own. So what was for your first band that was yours? Fuck, I've, like, I've always been way into music. Not always for the best. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you really want to know, the first band that I ever liked a lot was UB40. That like reggae band. Oh yeah. yeah. For me it wasn't a band. Well, it was a troupe. It was Destiny's Child. I really? had <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> it was a girl group. I my bedroom wall when I was a kid was fucking covered in pictures of Destiny's Child. And I still have uh these Grammy edition Destiny's Child Barbies that I got when I was maybe 10 and I still haven't opened to this day because I'm waiting for them to be valuable and they're not. <laughs> no, you never know. Then maybe they just made too many of them. That's the issue with these things. So. I think so. So I'm going to wait it out about 50 more years and see what I can do with that. Yeah. But I mean, honestly, whatever uh, was the heaviest thing I, I heard, I always liked that. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been listening to heavier music since I was really young. Just like whatever you'd hear. Maybe I heard Rage Against the Machine or something on the radio and I listened to that and then when I was 12 I heard Sepultura so there wasn't a whole lot of musical listening to before I got into metal. I mean I've been listening to metal most of my life. Yeah. I so. The first metal that I really got into <laughs> was probably a mix between System of a Down and Mudvayne and Slipknot. All of that stuff that was kind of circulating in the new metal you know, I'm 31, so I was coming up right when new metal was hitting corn and all of that stuff was really impactful for me. And I kind of moved into hardcore, metalcore, death metal, and the rest all is history, stuff. I guess. I'm an absolute new metal child, so no, no shame there. Yeah, what did you come up on? Oh, it started with uh, Marilyn Manson into corn. Oh, yeah. Into Slipknot, and from there it just took off, yeah. Totally. This morning I was revisiting actually uh, Chimera, who I haven't listened to in years. And I was describing them to Naveen before I listened. And I was like, yeah, I feel like they'd never sang. It was mostly screaming, but I went back and listened to it and it's all like screaming rap. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of surprised by that. It's just one of those bands that kind of fell off for me somewhere along the line. You know, some of those some of the things you listen to when you're a kid will really stick with you forever. But some of it you just lose track of. And that was one of those bands. And some of them age better than others. Yeah, yeah totally. Seriously. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, we were listening to like on a drive. We had a bunch of stuff to listen to. Or we were like just kind of going through old stuff. And I remember uh, Corn Issues was pretty sick. It's still oh, it good. Great. We're being yeah. like, that's pretty good, man. That like holds up. The production dude. on it was really good as well. Yeah, it was just a cool, like, I don't know. It was the right amount of like pop and the right amount of hit. Like, I don't know. It seemed like the kind of the pinnacle album, you know? Yeah. I have a funny story about issues. This is the only time I've ever stolen money from my parents. I was in grade 11, which is our last year of high school here in Montreal. And I told my parents that I needed 20 bucks for something school related and they gave me 20 bucks and I went to the record store and I bought issues. Nice. <laughs> the only nice. time I've ever stolen from my parents. I'm sorry, <laughs> mom. I'm not, <laughs> I know you listen to the podcast. That's funny because people <laughs> think that as metalheads, and especially for you and me, because we get on a stage and we scream our, our brains out. They think that we're evil and do all of this bad shit, but that's the only time you've done yeah, anything horrible. Dorks. Yeah. Yeah, I never was big on taking stuff from my parents or being that bad of a kid. I mean, I smoked pot and I drank a bit in high school, not that much, but I was never too bad of a kid. How did you go from from the wall panel destiny child fan to exactly what you just described, screaming on stage? So I was into Destiny's Child. I was in maybe, I was 10 or 11. And then 
but I, I was always into playing instruments. So when I was in eighth grade, I started surrounding myself with all of the other kids who liked to play instruments as well. And, and I just kind of started falling in the world of metal. I remember one of my friends specifically would bring me a mixtape that had all of that kind of new metal stuff on it mixed with maybe OTEP and other stuff. And that's kind of how I fell into metal. And it was pretty much a love affair from that point. I just dove deep into it and I was going to local shows all the time. And I, I just really, really started becoming enthralled with screaming and heavy music and letting out my aggression and everything else in that way. Were you always someone that sang? Yeah. So like yeah, a clean vocalist that transitioned into a screamer. Yeah, you can say that because you know, no one really starts off as a screamer. No. Well, we all do. We actually, we all do. Yeah. All oh, right. Very true. We <laughs> all start off as screamers and then it's kind of like it's taken out of us and some of us rediscover the voice and we... That's kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, I want to touch on something that I like to touch on whenever I have a female guest on the podcast. I am so fed up of all of these girl packages of, of getting bands that have females in the band being packaged together and put out on the road together, uh, getting dubbed as a female fronted band. Yeah. I, I'm sick of this. We are in 2020. We're all just musicians at this point. How do you feel about that? I'm in 100% agreement with you. I've never, ever liked that from day one. I've never been a person who wanted to make a huge deal out of the fact that I'm a woman. I've always just wanted to fit in. I've always just wanted to be one of the, the vocalists, one of the musicians. I, it's never... Uh, and so... When packages like that happen, it kind of bums me out because I already think that there's a problem with, uh, so for instance, if someone comes up to me and tells me another band that my band sounds like almost 99% of the time, it's every female fronted band from right now, Ginger is very popular. So Ginger from Ginger to Kitty to Arch Enemy to OTEP and sometimes in this moment, bands that sing all the time and don't scream at all. And I have only screamed on album. So that's always a bit perplexing to me. And I find that to be a problem. The female fronted thing I've never really enjoyed. I think that it comes off very gimmicky. And I've always wanted people to enjoy my band because of how my band sounds first and not because there's a girl leading the band or because they feel like, yeah, I just, I feel the exact same way about it as you do. When you, when you mentioned earlier that, that fans come up to you and ask you the same questions every night, how often is it related to the fact that you are a female fronted band? Uh, it varies. Some nights it's every question and some nights it's not a question at all. I think that People have become very aware of this whole situation because peop I, I think that a lot of women have been talking about it. Um, been talking about not wanting to be... Kind to of be, looped, as, to yeah. be looped in with the female fronted thing. And so because of that, I think that sometimes people are even scared that I might be upset with them because they m make note of that in talking to me. That's It's not really a question that annoys me when they talk about being a woman in a band because everyone is kind of curious and it's the questions are usually nice and I'm okay with answering them but yeah just I don't want to be a gimmick and I'm sure that that a lot of women can relate to me on that none of us want to be a gimmick we all just wanted to play music and it just so happened that we want to play metal because and because there aren't that many women who play metal it's it's an issue or it's it's not an issue but it's just a, a thing that comes up for people it's intriguing yeah, yeah. exactly I mean, another thing that we've come across a lot is the idea that because cheney's a girl everybody on tour sort of like would treat her different or yeah. like not treat her like she's kind of one of the one of the boys or whatever 
you know, like a lot of people will kind of have that assumption and kind of at, almost insinuate that to her and say, oh, well, it must be so hard, you know, being on these tours with all these guys and stuff. And it's like Chaney's just, you know, she's just like, no, not really. I mean, everybody that we've toured with has been really nice and never, no one even makes mention of it. You know, I mean, we are just always hanging out with everybody and it's from, from where I sit, I've not noticed her being treated any different than anybody else on the tour. Yeah. Even this morning, someone messaged me on Facebook and asked me if a lot of the men around me mansplained to me, which I'm not even totally, I had to ask Naveen totally what mansplaining means, but <laughs> no one who I've ever respected has mansplained to me. And that's, that's the easiest way to put it. No one that I've ever respected treats me differently for being a woman or... Uh, or even makes note of it, really. Like, they just treat me the same. So I think that it comes that way as well. Uh, I tour with a lot of really awesome people. And I think that, for the most part, the people that I've toured with just treat me like a normal person. That's it. That's a perfect answer. I love it. Let's touch on uh, starting a podcast. Uh, I feel like a lot of other people are starting a podcast right now during quarantine uh, I'm seeing a lot of them pop up. Uh, how did you guys get into the game way before that? <laughs> uh, Chaney always wanted to do a podcast. She's like, so she would always say like, Naveen, we got to do a podcast to be really fun. You know, we got to, there's so much stuff we could talk about. You know, it's something cool that we could do. We could, you know, put a lot of cool ideas out there or whatever. And, uh, I was always into it, but I like being the more technical end of the, of the thing. I was like, well, shit, I'll have to figure out how to use the software and get the equipment and yada, yada, yada. So I spent some time doing that. And then, well, I mean, one weekend we were just like, all right, we're doing it this weekend. And we didn't have any plan or, or structure and we still don't, but <laughs> we just hit the record or whatever on the, I figured out how to use this software and uh, that that was that. And we've done it every single week since then. Yeah. So See, that was the thing. I needed him on board because I knew that we could have a good podcast, but I needed his technical skills. I know some things about computers, but Naveen knows everything. So yeah. we needed... And it's, yeah, I mean, it's cool. Everyone is quarantined, so they're starting a podcast. It'll be interesting to see how many of them st stick around after the quarantine's over, you know? And, uh, I mean, I look at it as it's all good. I mean, if, if the more, the merrier, you know, totally. if people, there's a lot of people out there. So if they want to have a show and express their ideas and that, all that stuff, then that's great. And, you know, have us on there, like how, how we're doing. So, and yeah, kind of likewise to what you said earlier that, uh, I don't know if we were recording or not when you said this, but that there's not really that many underground metal podcasts and I think in a similar fashion of yours it's ours is I think we've we've just noticed that a lot of people they really just sort of wonder what it's like to be in a touring band or a metal metal band that's like maybe not the most famous band ever but you know like a band like ours that's gone on a lot of tours or or just us as individuals and they can just see that it's not really that much different than their life. And I think that might actually give people some comfort, you know, uh -huh. like, like thinking, cause you know, when you're in a smaller band or a local band, you're thinking like, Oh, if I could just go on tour, then everything would be so great. You know? And it's like, that's nice to think that, but everybody has their own shit to deal with. And it's like your reality just changes as you go through these different phases, you know? Uh -huh. Absolutely. And as far as all of these podcasts coming out right now, I think that's great. If you look at the comedy community, which is what I was inspired by in the first place, there's this podcast that I'm into called Your Mom's House. And it's Tom Segura, the comedian. I love that guy. Yeah, me too. And his wife, Christina Pajitsky. They just sit and talk shit and it's silly and whimsical. And for me, I find myself listening to it all the time because it's just a way to escape the CNN and Fox world that we're living in. Yeah. And with the comedy community, it's really helping comedy rise to the top right now. 
I would say that as far as the entire comedy community goes from the super uh, well-known comedians like Dave Chappelle down to comedians that no one knows about, all of them are becoming more known through starting podcasts and forming this community and having just having that in common and having each other on their podcasts and things like that. And for people who aren't necessarily into death metal, like for our parents, for instance, it's a really cool way to, to make something for those people to also be interested in and draw them in. That's true. Very true. Everything you said. And that's why last weekend I created that group on Facebook with all of the podcasters that I knew so that we can all connect together and uh, try to bring up our, our whole scene together. That's what's uh, so important in the this underground metal scene. Totally. Yeah. And it's, it's also just another thing for people who like the music. Uh, like we can't put out, well, we could, but we're probably not going to. We can't put out music every single week. Yeah. So it's cool to just be able to talk about ideas that you want to do or or whatever. And, and I think about it sometimes. I think another thing, reservation that I had was if I do a podcast, like I want it to be helpful to people, you know, and I was kind of worried that like, Oh, look at me talk, you know, I'm, I'm this cool guy and all this, that, that, and the other thing, like, I don't really want to come off like that. I, I more want to, uh, ultimately I'd like to help people in some way. And so I was worried that I would come not come off that way, but I think ultimately it has been a positive, like I said, for people to, just be able to tune in and be like, Oh, what are these guys up to? You know, what are the, and, and we're always honest about just whatever's going on in our life. We don't try to make our life seem like it's this huge glamor show, you know, when it's really not like a lot of people do, you know? So that's where we're at. This is going to be end <laughs> of our side. All right. Cause this is a special episode that we're doing right now. So everyone that's listening right now, if you want to hear the end of this interview, you're going to have to go listen to the copper crab podcast and uh, listen to the end of this episode. So uh, I'm sending you all there. The link for that is going to be in the description of this episode. And uh, I'm super stoked to keep talking with you in a, in a few seconds. See you in a minute. Right on, man. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to almost the end. Is it the end? No, it's not the end because part two of this podcast is available, as we just mentioned, on the Copper Crab podcast. I have left a link for that in the description of this podcast. You should absolutely go and see how this all ends. Uh, I had a great time hooking up with fellow podcasters. It is great. It's, it's, uh, nobody understands what we go through to get our content out to all of you better than ourselves. It's very important for us to uplift the metal podcast scene i am trying to unite with all metal podcasters so if you know of any that i might not know of please push me in their direction you can do that by sending me an email at matt at vox or you can simply let me know on my social medias i hope you guys have a great rest of the week i have two more episodes coming at you this week one on wednesday and the other on friday but until then i hope that you remember to enjoy life metal and craft beer cheers vox and hops heads oh,